about that while everybody gets their food, and then I will introduce our uh, outstanding visiting professor. This is the Sheila Hutzler Green Memorial Lecture. Uh, some of you who are with us every time know that we do this uh, twice a year. Uh, this is uh, as a result of a wonderful uh, gift from Ellie Trowbridge, who was a member of the board of the Berman Institute of Biologics and also, uh, as it happens, of the Berman School, of the Bloomberg School of Public Health. She's very, very devoted to Hopkins and an extraordinarily uh, wonderful person. Ellie's daughter, I'm sorry, Ellie, um, Ellie's daughter, Sheila, uh, tragically died of breast cancer in her 20s. And Ellie had been thinking for a long time about that experience as most people would in, in the tragedy of that sort, but especially about the ethical dimensions at the end of her, not only her daughter's life, but her first husband's life. And so she determined to create this lectureship in honor of Ellie uh, to give uh, our community an opportunity to hear from distinguished scholars, both here at Hopkins and uh, around the world, their reflections on ethical challenges at or near or around end of life or having to do with serious illness. So that's why we are fortunate enough today, because of Ellie Trowbridge's uh, honor of her daughter, Sheila, to be able to invite uh, John Lantos to be the Sheila Hesler Reeves visiting professor uh, for us this winter spring. So let me just say a word or two about Dr. Lantos and then uh, do it really briefly because we always have as much time as possible uh, to hear from him. We are truly honored to have Dr. Lantos here, Dr. John Lantos. He is one of the most uh, distinguished uh, physicians and distinguished scholars in our field of bioethics. By background, Dr. Lantos is a pediatrician. For many, many years, he was the associate director of the McLean Center for Clinical Ethics at the University of Chicago, where he also co-directed the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program there. Uh, he left uh, Chicago several years ago to go to the Center for Practical Bioethics in Kansas City, and most recently has uh, moved on from there to become the director of a new pediatric bioethics program at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Uh, Dr. Lantos is not only a distinguished scholar in bioethics, he is also a very distinguished pediatrician. He has been uh, a leader for us in the field. He's been the president of the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities, as well as the American Society of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. He's also been uh, very, very uh, generous with his time uh, with regard to the general public. It appears in, in really impressive and appropriate ways uh, in media outlets, and has otherwise done uh, a great deal in the service of advancing the, the public interest. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lantos to Hopkins. Is this flip on? Thank you. 
for people who, for whom it should work the best, that is, people who are doctors and bioethicists taking care of family members and therefore should be unusually sophisticated in figuring out uh, uh, how to make uh, the current system uh, work. And I'll try to finish by one -ish so that we can have a little time for discussion, but that means I may talk a little fast. So my father died in the early morning of the Sabbath between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur in 2007. As he lay dying, I was at synagogue listening to the traditional reading for the new year, the famously disturbing story in which God tests Abraham. Following God's command, Abraham takes Isaac to Mount Moriah, binds him on the altar, and raises the ritual slaughtering knife to slit his son's throat. This story has surely driven more people away from monotheism than any other ever written. And it fit my mood because I too was feeling torn between conflicting obligations. I knew that dad was dying. He'd got pneumonia and we had decided not to treat him with antibiotics. He had stopped eating and we had decided not to start intravenous feedings. He seemed to be comatose, but we'd asked them to give him some morphine anyway. The hospice doctor had raised his eyebrows at this request, but said nothing. It didn't really matter. He would surely die in a matter of days. I did not doubt that we'd made the right decision, but it still all felt vaguely uncomfortable, vaguely shameful, vaguely sinful. The biblical story of Abraham and Isaac is written in an eerie, almost dreamlike language, full of linguistic tropes and rhythmic repetitions, with God first calls Abraham. Abraham responds, responds, Hineni, here I am. And later when Isaac calls out to Abraham and says, Father, Abraham again responds, here I am. He gives the same response when the angel calls out to him as he raises the knife to slaughter his son. Abraham is there for God, for his son Isaac, and for the angel even as the three make impossibly irreconcilable demands. The story is one of divided loyalties, tensions between our deepest values, our strongest obligations, and our most passionate love. In my decisions about my dad, I felt like I was being tested. Was letting him die a manifestation of my loyalty to him? Or was I abdicating my filial duty? I didn't want him to die. I didn't think that he would want to live in the condition that he was in, but was that my decision to make? I didn't know, and I still don't know whether I got the right answer. Clinical bioethics answers such questions using complex decision-making algorithms or risk management strategies or four-box models or techniques for conflict resolution, and the answers that bioethics provides are somewhat abstract, legalistic, procedural, and rational thin facades of philosophic palliation trying to ease the primal pain. All the ethical theory in the world could not help me get over the feeling that I had decided to kill my father. The Children's Hospital where I work, we were recently consulted about a two-year-old with Menke's disease. Menke's is one of those rare, terrible, degenerative diseases of childhood that causes gradual, inexorable neurologic deterioration. Most babies die before their first birthday. Most parents accept the hopelessness of the disease and choose palliative care. In this case, however, the mother insisted that the doctors and nurses continue to provide all potentially life-prolonging treatments, including long stays in the pediatric intensive care unit for mechanical ventilation twice daily painful intramuscular injections of copper, a treatment that had been shown not to do any good, but that a doctor in the community was prescribing. The treatments were keeping the baby alive, it seemed, but it seemed to be a life of pain and suffering. The nurses felt like they were simply torturing the baby, and they were shocked that the mother, who was at the bedside every day, didn't also realize how continued treatment was causing ongoing and intractable suffering for this poor baby. They thought an ethics consultant might help. The mother was deeply religious. Her decisions for her son were, she felt, the decisions that God demanded of her. She embodied a strange Abrahamic contradiction. Her choices were agonizing to her, but she had no doubt whatsoever that they were correct. And the passivity of her certainty was what was driving everyone crazy. Her 
son suffered as he gasped for breath, convulsed in seizures, gagged as he was suctioned and moaned after each injection. And she watched and she prayed. This year during the high holidays, my reflections about dad on the fourth anniversary of his death mingled with thoughts of my mother-in-law, Mary, who at the age of 85 had just been admitted to the hospital with pneumonia. Mary had had a few health problems over the years. 11 years ago, she was successfully treated for breast cancer. Five years ago, she developed atrial fibrillation and had a pacemaker put in. She'd been losing her vision to macular degeneration and of late had been getting a bit forgetful. But she's so smart that she's able to hide the forgetfulness well and nimbly participate in conversations that seem to make sense until suddenly you realize that they've lost whatever organizing thread they started out with. Sometimes this happened with my dad. It seemed like she was not so much losing her mind as she was becoming oddly poetic. Conversations had a kind of blank verse enigma about them. It made me wonder if they were nonsense or profundity. In spite of all her problems, she was, before uh, the recent hospitalization, surprisingly active. She'd been going to aerobics classes in her retirement community, was able to get to her great-grandchildren's birthday parties, still able to do some work in the garden, and it would have been hard to assign a number between 1 and 10 to her quality of life. She and her husband, Sam, have been married for 64 years. He's a retired physician, 86 years old, and in pretty good health himself since his aortic valve replacement and quadruple bypass three years ago. Before the operation, he had been getting slower, weaker, and more short of breath, couldn't keep up with his regular doubles matches. His internist sent him to a pulmonologist who tried a few antibiotics, and those didn't help. And eventually, he found his way to a cardiologist who diagnosed the valvular uh, uh, and coronary artery problem. The operation was a success, but his post-operative course was rough. He was frustrated and depressed at his slow recovery. He stopped eating and didn't want to get out of bed. And I didn't think he was going to make it. And frankly, I wasn't all that surprised. After all, valve replacement and quadruple bypass at 84 is no small operation. He survived, I think, because of two things. His internist started him on some antidepressants, and a very pretty physical therapist started making home visits. <laughs> For her, he would get out of bed and do his exercises. She coaxed and cajoled him and rekindled his will to live. He's now back on the tennis court playing doubles three times a week. Serotonin and testosterone are a powerful combination. <laughs> a few weeks ago, then, Mary started coughing and became short of breath. She tried resting at home for a few days, but the symptoms worsened. She was admitted to the hospital to picnic and a little hypoxic. The chest x-ray showed diffuse infiltrates. They started antibiotics. She got worse. The next day, she was moved to the ICU. They began bypass. She got agitated and confused and kept trying to tear the cumbersome BiPAP device off her face. To stop her, they sedated her and restrained her arms. Her breathing got worse. A follow-up chest x-ray showed widespread pulmonary infiltrates throughout her lungs. Her liver was enlarged. Her kidneys shut down. And family members around the country flew home to offer support and say goodbye. The family asked the doctors if there was any hope of recovery. The doctors hemmed and hawed. Patients with these sort of symptoms, they said, rarely get out of the hospital alive, but each of her problems, taken in isolation, seemed treatable. Sam was not ready to give up. No limitations were placed on her treatment, in spite of the fact that Mary had said for years and years that she would never want to be put on a ventilator. No DNR order was written. Nothing was withheld or withdrawn. Now Mary's situation, hovering on the brink and needing a decision, reminded me of one I'd faced with my father a few years before he died, when one night my mother found him unconscious on the bathroom floor at 2 in the morning in a pool of blood and vomit. She called 911. The paramedics took him to the hospital. She called me a few hours later once he was
stable and sedated in the ICU. I got on a plane and had no idea whether he'd still be alive when I arrived in Washington, D.C. I wasn't sure what I was hoping for. I met Mom in the waiting room of the ICU. She looked both frightened and helpless, wondering, I'm sure, whether she'd leave the hospital a widow. She was a small woman, but she looked even tinier than usual. The prior few years had been brutal for her. She cared for Dad as he lost one capacity after another. She slowly, painfully, and sometimes bitterly gave up on one dream after another. Like many patients with Parkinson's disease, Dad had been dying for a long time. With the 20 years or so in which he'd struggled with the inevitable, the man he had once been seemed to disappear into the disease. The transformation was initially so slow and subtle that we were able to ignore it. Only people who saw him intermittently were able to see just how dramatically the disease had taken its toll. Before, he had been vibrant, jaunty, athletic, even a bit of a rogue. He always had a twinkle in his eye. After his face became the mask-like face mm. of Parkinson's disease, his body a weighty and ungainly load. After his death, we looked through old pictures and realized that his disease had clearly begun and was readily visible a full 10 years before we acknowledged it. He probably did. He was an internist and an expert diagnostician, but he never talked about it. During the months before he collapsed and was admitted to the ICU, he had spent his days sitting on the porch, wrapped in a blanket, staring at nothing. To me, he seemed painfully diminished as a human being, but maybe not. Maybe he had achieved the sort of inner peace, simplicity, and tranquility that the rest of us <coughs> long for but cannot find. He no longer felt restlessness or curiosity or desire. Mom and I sat together for a few minutes outside the ICU. She told me again what had happened the night before, how she'd found him filthy and disoriented on the bathroom floor, and the urgency of her morning telephone call was now gone as the events became a story, an ordered narrative rather than the chaotic battlefield dispatches of the night before. I listened, I held her hand, I praised her presence of mind. You saved his life. I told her, it's lucky you were there. I suggested that she take a break and go get a cup of coffee. We were at the VA hospital in Washington. The ICU was overcrowded in a 1980s sort of way. It wasn't one of the temples to technology that one sees in private hospitals where the ICUs look like the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. In Washington, it was just a bunch of old vets crowded together in a semi-open ward, hooked to their monitors and IVs. At first, I couldn't find Dad. Everybody in the ICU looks different than they usually look. They look like prisoners, pale, haunted, and frail, with a mixture of terror, confusion, and guilt in their eyes. The stress of the illness, the overlay of the opioids, the bizarre light and the noise and the hospital <coughs> gowns all combined to make everybody look a little generic. I scanned the faces, scanned them again, and then finally picked them out from the crowd of sallow-skinned, white-haired, hollowed-eyed veterans. Dad, I called as I approached his bed. His eyes found mine. He tried to raise his hands, tried to smile, but couldn't do either. He had a tube down his nose that was caked brown. He had IVs and monitor leads on both arms. I patted his hand, kissed him on the forehead, and said with a smile, man, you look like shit. <laughs> his grimace seemed like an attempt at a smile, and a tear rolled down his cheek. What the hell are they doing to you? We gotta get you back home. He waved vaguely at the other beds in the ICU, rolled his eyes, shrugged, and whispered, gee, I believe it seems to have stopped. And then stating the obvious, short of breath. <laughs> a nurse appeared, a tall man with close cropped hair and a gold stud in one ear, wearing scrubs. <coughs> Hi, I said, I'm Dr. Lantos' son. How's he doing? Well, he had a tough night. He seems better now. He's on some oxygen. We've given him some blood. And he turned to Dad. How you feeling, Ray? Does anything hurt? No. I'm okay. Thank you. His heart rate 
rate jumped to 140, and his O2 sats dipped down into the low 90s, just mumbling a sentence was wearing him out. He could end up on a ventilator. He could die. I had to find his doctor. The nurses directed me to the chief of neurology. I found the chief in his windowless office, surrounded by diplomas and pictures of his kids. He had that distinguished patrician, gray-haired look that middle-aged doctors get if they don't become alcoholics. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted him to be wise. After some pleasantries, he started explaining Dad's situation. GI bleed, possible aspirations, and respiratory distress. His tone of voice suggested this was pretty routine, that he'd hope that our conversation would be quick and simple. Dad's pretty stable, not get out of the woods, of course, need to stay in the ICU overnight. Overall, <coughs> things look good. I said that I wanted to talk about a DNR order. He looked surprised. He quickly reassured me as if I hadn't heard the first time that Dad was going to pull through and that he could look forward to a high quality of life. I tried to be clearer. I said, that Mom and I had talked, and we felt that in his current condition, Dad would not want to be intubated or put on a ventilator. The doctor then tried to be clearer, too, and explained to me in that tone of voice one might use with a dull and somewhat recalcitrant student that it wasn't yet time to start withholding life support, and that for now, what we really needed to do was get Dad through this acute illness. His message and his tone infuriated me. I felt a surprising surge of adrenaline. My heart was pounding. I had not anticipated that this would be a conversation in which I would need to control my anger. But for just a moment, I wanted to reach across his big wooden desk, grab him by the throat, and shout in his face, what the hell do you know about my dad and his quality of life? What the hell do you know? about who he is or what he needs, what makes you think for even a second that your opinions matter. But I took a deep breath. I am, after all, a biorhythmist. <laughs> I know how such conversations must go. It would be a discussion between strangers about procedural principles. It would not be philosophical or soul-searching. We would not plumb the psychological depths of what it might mean for a son to lose his father, or the complexities of that loss when it followed the son's deliberate and conscious decision to allow medical technology to be withheld or withdrawn. No, and nor would it be a theological discussion. We would not mention God or sin or salvation. We would not talk about commitments or duties or obligations. He was the neurologist, a technical expert in EEGs and MRIs and neurotransmitters and pharmacology. And to him, I was the son from out of town. He didn't know if Dad and I were close or distant, whether we'd talked frequently or hadn't spoken in years. He'd seen all kinds from the guilt-ridden sons who'd abandoned their parents and now came back to demand all sorts of futile treatments trying to redeem themselves, the others who came back to try to bump off mom or dad in order to get their hands on the inheritance. Nothing would surprise me. I pointed out that dad had a living will. Yes, the neurologist said, looking both thoughtful and a little pain, but I don't think your dad currently has a terminal condition. He just has a little respiratory distress, probably a mild aspiration. So a living will is not really relevant in this situation. I grudgingly admired his deft move <laughs> and had to admit that his concerns were valid ones. Did Dad fill out a living will because he wanted treatment to be limited only when he was clearly dying or because in his current state of health he hadn't, had wanted to refuse all life-sustaining interventions? The document itself, I was pretty sure, would not help was probably some standard boilerplate language that they'd gotten from their estate planning attorney. They kept it in their safe deposit box. And when mom had told me about it, she lowered her voice to a whisper as if it was a sharp, painful secret. OK, paternalism one, autonomy zero. I tried a different tack. 
I said, just that morning when I was in the ICU, Dad and I had discussed the ventilator, and he had told me that he didn't want to be put on a ventilator. This was sort of true. <laughs> it had truthiness. <laughs> Sitting by Dad's bedside earlier, I knew I should at least try to talk to him about what was going on. I had to find out what he understood and what he was thinking. I was scared to begin the conversation. It's not easy <coughs> to ask your dad if he's ready to die. And he and I had never really talked about his disease or about much else. He was not an introspective or self-revealing man. He preferred the comforts of a martini to the consolation of conversation. When he first developed symptoms of Parkinson's disease, he did not acknowledge it, although he must have known his symptoms were classic. <coughs> but he didn't want to talk about it. Now he needed to talk. If his breathing got worse, they would put him on a ventilator. If they didn't, he would die. I asked him how he was feeling. He shrugged. I asked him if he was getting all the pain medication he needed. He nodded. I asked him what his doctors had told him about what was going on. Not much, he whispered. I worked up my courage and asked the big question, Dad, what if your breathing gets worse and they want to put you on a ventilator? Should I let them? Without a pause and with just a trace of bitterness, he said, why? It had the form of a question, but it felt like a statement of dismissal. And then, oddly, he switched to the third person and said enigmatically, why would we want to intubate an old guy like him? It took me a minute to make the transition he made, the shift from thinking of this as a decision he was making for himself to thinking of it as a decision that he might make as a doctor for a patient in his condition. The first person in the sentence became, and it became an ambiguously plural we, and dad himself became a third person an old guy in a hospital bed who we ought not intubate. I often replay that conversation in my head, and each time it seems more remarkable. To authorize his own death, he had transformed himself into an object of the decision rather than the subject. The neurologist, interestingly, did not ask me about the details of the conversation. Instead, he simply dismissed it. <coughs> Dad's dementia had progressed to the point, he said, where he really didn't have the capacity to make decisions anymore. Furthermore, the stress of his acute illness was probably compromising his decision-making capacity even further. I wondered if this guy was chair of his hospital ethics committee. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, I had to admit, I sort of agreed with him. The only reason why Dad's opinions actually carried any weight with me was because I agreed with them and thought it was the right decision. If I had actually thought that he would recover, I wouldn't have paid any attention to his request in that condition not to be intubated. I, too, would have been morbid. Paternalism, too, autonomy, nothing. Still, I wasn't ready to give up. I made what I thought would be my decisive final move. Dad, I said, has a durable power of attorney for health care, naming my mother <coughs> as his proxy decision maker. She told me that she wants a DNR order. So do I. So I thought smugly I had him cornered now. Dad was confident that he had expressed his own wishes. He was incompetent, and she got to make the decision by a living will, a current statement, and a duly appointed proxy. Give me a break. He nodded sagely, reassured me that all he wanted to do was what was best for my dad, and said that since mom was his durable power of attorney, he would need to talk to her himself to be certain that she understood the current situation, the treatment options, and the prognosis. As his proxy, she needed to be fully informed. Specifically, he said he wanted to be sure that she understood that if Dad needed to be intubated, it would just be a day or two, and he fully expected that he would recover fully. I knew Mom would cave. <laughs> She'd gone along with me. She would 
would go along with him, and she would not insist on a DNR or a DNI because she generally deferred to doctors because she herself was emotionally distraught and conflicted, and because the way the neurologist explained things, it didn't really make sense or seem to make sense to withhold something that at that point for that illness seemed so simple and so effective. Not really a victory for, for paternalism then, instead a victory for the conspiracy of love. <coughs> Conversations between family members and doctors about life-sustaining treatment often go like this. The rules seem clear enough at the outset that the longer the conversation goes on, the less important or relevant those rules seem. I conceded defeat. Now, the neurologist and I would not have had to have this conversation 30 or 40 years ago. Then he would have made the decision and informed us of the plan. I would have acquiesced. I might have been grateful or bitter, but in either case, I would have been voiceless and powerless. Now he had to negotiate with me, with my mother, with us, had to exercise his power in more subtle and constrained ways. I, or we, the family, had more power than we would have had decades ago, but both our power and his were carefully constrained by the new social, legal, and philosophic consensus about what we could do, when we could do it, what we could not do, and why. This current approach, this prevailing consensus, this powerfully autonomy-oriented approach to end-of-life decisions is profoundly idealistic about the capacities of individuals to plan their own deaths and to do so in ways consistent with their own values. It is also deeply cynical about the value or the trustworthiness of relationships, family, community. It assumed that dad <coughs> needed to be protected not just from his doctors and the ICU, but also from me and my brothers and sister, and from his wife, from our fears and our potentially selfish goals. The paradoxical outcome of this process for Dad, and in the same way for my mother-in-law, Mary, was that in the end, nobody really respected their autonomy or empowered them to live and die according to their own deeply, deeply held values. Instead, we paid lip service to autonomy, but then neutered it with a series of castrating procedural obstructions. It has taken 40 years for us to figure out how this new system works and doesn't work. And over the course of this 40-year social experiment, we've learned some interesting things about ourselves and had to revise our thinking, or should, about who we are and what we want. Back in the 70s, many lawyers, policymakers, and bioethicists believed that they understood what the problem was with end-of-life care. It was that patients and families generally did not want as much high-tech, life-prolonging treatment as their technology-crazed doctors were providing. By this, by this view, the problem was that doctors could not accept death and that doctors had all the power in clinical decisions. The solution then was to somehow empower patients and families to resist doctors and to refuse unwanted life-sustaining treatment. The result was just the sort of conversation I was having with the neurologist in which I was invoking all these new frameworks for decision-making that had been developed over the intervening years. The surprise, though, has been that most families are not like me and do not want to refuse life-sustaining treatment for their loved ones. They are more like Sam as he was in relation to Mary. They want even more life-sustaining treatment than the patient would have wanted or than the doctors and nurses think is appropriate. Instead of needing to be protected from physician-driven over-treatment, many patients and families find themselves in a situation of the mother of the child with Frankie's <coughs> disease, opting for more treatment rather than less. And the very same laws that empowered families to refuse empower them to demand. The result has been the current situation in ICU and end-of-life care, a kind of crazy quilt of autonomy and paternalism 
the focus on the patient and the focus on the family and of an absurd array of options for life-prolonging treatment and subtle and insidious ways of limiting access to these for some people in some situations. We draw the line at one end of the spectrum with the contentious debate about whether or not patients and families can demand treatment that doctors think is absolutely futile. We draw the line at the other end of the spectrum with the prohibition of active euthanasia. But in between those liminal taboos, our way of death is to authorize and subsidize individuals and families to write whatever endings they can negotiate with their doctors to the stories of their own lives and the lives of loved ones as long as they are persuasive and have the courage of their convictions. Another surprise as we've watched this new consensus play itself out in practice has been that the loosening of rules governing decisions about end of life care has not led to a slide down a steep slippery slope toward the devaluation of life as some predicted. Many predicted that with loosening rules about access to ICU care and permitting people to uh, uh, withhold or withdraw life-sustaining treatment or even to uh, get physicians to assist them in their suicides, we would see a slide toward the devaluation of the lives of the old, the, the, the disabled, the marginalized, the disempowered. And surprisingly, these slopes don't seem to be as slippery as they once seemed. If anything, the rules have worked the other way, empowering the old, disabled, the marginalized to assert themselves and shape their own treatment. Even assisted suicide, where it has been legalized, that is in some states in the US, or active euthanasia, which has been legalized in some countries in Europe, hasn't been used very widely. Instead, these options, too, have become a fairly stable feature of this menu of available choices for end-of-life decisions chosen by a fairly small subset of people for what seem, for the most part, to be the sorts of conditions for which their use was generally considered most ethically defensible. We don't see, as Kurt Vonnegut predicted, suicide parlors alongside hospitals, sports arenas, and brothels. Finally, most people who choose palliative care today do not choose it instead of aggressive, life-sustaining treatment or life-prolonging care. Instead, like good Americans, they choose it in addition to life-prolonging care. So even though today a third of American deaths take place in hospice, Americans get more ICU <coughs> care than ever. Then they get more hospice care too. Palliative care is a supplement, not an alternative. As a result, the rise in palliative care doesn't save money in the way that proponents once imagined that it would. It contributes to, rather than controls, rising health care costs. Our current approach to these end-of-life decisions is widely perceived to be unsustainable. On this, pundits, policymakers, and bioethicists across the political and philosophical spectrum agree. We can't go on this way. But of course, nobody agrees on the solution, and the stalemate just leads to one unsavory and invective-driven compromise after another. So where will it all lead? What will end-of-life care look like 25 years from now? Well, as Yogi Berra said, predictions are really hard, especially about the future. But stories like my dad's and Sam's and Mary's and of the little child with Mankey's disease may shed some light on where things are going and what they're likely to look like, although it's not clear to me that these could be called, in any sense of the word, solutions. No DNR or DNI order was written for my father that night. After a conversation with the neurologist, my mom said that she just wasn't ready. As it turned out, it didn't matter. He made it through the night without needing intubation. His respiratory distress gradually improved. He was transferred out of the ICU the next day, and all our discussions had been a sort of practice run. Eventually, Mom could no longer take care of him at home. He moved to the Hebrew home of Montgomery County, and there for about $10,000 a month, a fee that did not cover 
telephone service, cable television, laundry, or barber shop fees. <laughs> he was cared for by excellent Filipino and West African nurses for the next four years. His dementia worsened. By the end, he didn't recognize anyone in the family, didn't know where he was, and it was no longer worth the trouble of trying to help him get to the bathroom. Instead, he lay in bed with a diaper and a condom catheter. He was still able to eat by mouth, but slowly lost weight. And every six months or so, he would get a fever. And each time, Mom had to decide whether to authorize a chest X-ray, an antibiotic. And each decision was a struggle. And after each such episode, Mom agreed and then second-guessed herself and swore that it would be the last time. What's the point, she asked, whenever he was well. And when, she got, when he got sick, she changed her mind. I suggested that we enroll Dad in hospice. She didn't want to do that either. In her mind, oddly, he wasn't dying. He was just dwindling. And when he wasn't acutely ill, he didn't seem to be dying and wasn't suffering. <coughs> he would always greet me with a clueless cheerfulness. Our conversations were lovely and completely ephemeral. Anything we said would just disappear. He remembered nothing. Every once in a while, he would say something witty or poetic, something that could have been a really clever haiku. <laughs> I wrote some of them down. Once he said, looking out the window, the children on, their playground, on the playground fly to their parents like you used to do. Or another time, he said, my father came last night. He cried, so I gave him my soup. <laughs> One day, he developed a high fever, cold sweats, and a rider as the nurses asked what we want to do, and we finally agreed not to give him antibiotics. We called family members and told them he was dying. The hospice folks came Friday morning, uh, Friday afternoon, and Dad died early Saturday morning. He was in hospice for less than 24 hours, but will show up in the statistics as someone who dies under the care of hospice. Meanwhile, Mary seemed to be getting better. After two days at death's door, two days of anuria, two days of relatives sitting quietly at the bedside talking to her unresponsive and sedated body, not knowing if she heard anything that was said, she decided not to die after all. Her kidneys opened up. She started breathing better. She was able to recognize family members and carry on brief conversations. And for a few days, nobody was really ready to believe that she was going to make it. But when she was off bypass, transferred to the floor, and was not only responsive to everyone in conversation, but actually got back to being her old irascible self, demanding to be discharged and complaining about the food, we began to believe that she might actually survive. I was shocked, but had long ago learned humility about prognostication. So what do we learn from these stories? The decisions that we agonize about are not always the ones that are the most important. We agonize about whether to put dad on a ventilator, but he ended up not needing one. Mary, too, got out of the ICU without a vent. Families and doctors seem to stumble in the darkness of prognostic uncertainty. We try to do the best we can with the technological and moral tools that we have, and collectively, we are sometimes able to find an acceptable, if not a perfect, balance between individual rights and communal norms, between what's best for the patient and what's best for the family. Some rabbis think that Abraham did not pass God's test. They argue that God really wanted him to protest when he asked Abraham to take his son up the Mount Moriah. Protest the way Abraham did in a prior episode in the Bible when God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And as evidence that God was not happy with Abraham, they cite the fact that after the events on Mount Moriah, God never speaks to Abraham again. Abraham never speaks to Isaac again. And the next we hear of Sarah is of her death. It's hard to know whether we are passing our tests. The little child with Menke's disease went home on bypass and is still home and alive today.
Mary's recovery lasted two days. Then she became septic, returned to the ICU, and died. The family told themselves, we didn't give up. We did everything we could. And luckily, that is not quite right. We almost never, thank God, do everything we did. Instead, we try to find this new and elusive balance, doing everything that makes sense within the complex framework of each particular illness, and reminding ourselves that sometimes, even for a loved one, death is not the worst outcome.
a trick question, right? No, it's not. So how are you going to how are you going to do this, and what measure of outcomes are you going to do this if not individualism? I, I think it's sort of shifting to a, a as some of your work has shown to a sort of complex family well-being measure of outcome. That is, we're willing to compromise on autonomy for a sort of not societal utilitarian, but family utilitarian measure where sort of everybody feels good and is left with a story that they can live with. So in Mary's case, everybody could say, we didn't give up, which seemed like a good thing, even though giving up was what she would have said she wanted. And I think that's, that's sort of where we're heading. It's, it's, it's 
why we are who we are. We, and given who we are, yeah. we, you know, to understand biometric, American biometrics, you have to understand baseball. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but try to find an article about a futility problem in a European ICU. They don't have futility problems. Because the idea that a patient would demand the treatment of the doctors think is brutal. Doesn't that. Apparently doesn't that. Or no theoretical. It's pretty good for it. So uh, I think that the question is what is the Under budget. <laughs> it was extraordinary talking. Thank you so much.